And thank you very much, Star Donovan. Will there be a recording today is what she put in there. And yes, there will. All right. All right and here it goes. Time. Okay, everybody. So um, welcome to the Texas Teams community call um, for May 13th. Um, we are now a year and a quarter into having our community. So um, this is awesome. Thank you so much to everybody that's joining. And thank you, as always, to Joy um, with the DIR. Um, it's, uh, it's so much fun to keep doing these. So Let's dig in a little bit. Um, as you know, our theme for this year is roads. Where we're going, we don't need roads. So let's see if my uh, my video is going to play and participate and get us all in the mood here. I love that. <laughs> I never get tired of that. Um, are y'all hearing the audio? Loud and clear. Yep. Okay. Yeah. I don't. I don't hear it. You don't. Um. Um. Hmm, everybody else heard it, so it may be a setting on your side. And so, apologies. It was really cool. I mean, it was. It was. It was okay. Um. Okay. So, um, the community interest list. Um. I've admitted before, and now I really got to lean on Billy now that he's here. I've really got to set this up automated, Billy, so that when people sign up, they actually get the meeting invite and all that kind of stuff. So Billy's going to hook me up. But the community interest list is where you sign up to be on this list, or I've actually had two people say, take me off the list, which is totally cool. It's a super manual process, so um, we're going to fix that. Billy's going to help me. Um, all you got to do is point your smartphone at the QR code, or you can go to that shortened URL. It's a Microsoft form. You sign up, and um, we'll put you on the list. Um, what I'm doing right now is I'm opening up last month's meeting. I'm adding any new in invitees, and then I'm sending it out to everybody again. So, um, yeah, not eating my own dog food, as they say. Um, okay, so welcome. 3 to 3.10. We're five minutes out over. Um, so 3.10 to 3.30, we're going to cover, wow, that's a lot of new features. So I have a lot of new features that I'm going to cover um, with you guys and share with not only what has released, um, but also what is releasing for GCC um, with a, you know, a little bit of a broad time range on it over just really like the next month and a half. Um, I'm really, really excited about what has released, and I'm even more excited because one of the members of my team took the massive um, job of creating a slide deck of all of the release articles and all the message center posts and links to additional information about all the new features. And so we're going to be going through that, and I'm going to share the link with you. And this is a slide deck that we are going through weekly and updating, so it will always be fresh within – about a five-day period of the features that are released, the features that are coming, and additional information about that feature. Now, these are end-user features, and these are also admin features. So there's a lot of lot there. Um, and we're going to kind of blast through it because I'm going to send all this to you in the slides afterward, and you'll, still, you'll have all the links. So forgive me if I sort of blast through. From 3.30 to 4, because Billy now has appointments on his calendar with other people inside of Microsoft, so he's got to go at 4.00. Um, we're going to do It's Billy Time, and it's going to be awesome. And then from 4 to 4.30, um, I have a special guest joining us. His name is Mike Rogers. Um, he's a guy that I've gotten to work with for the last couple of years. He is the devices specialist for state and local government. And he's going to talk to us a little bit about the uh, – we're going to talk a little bit about the human and the hardware aspect of hybrid work and remote work. And um, what do we have available both from Microsoft as well as one of our partners I'm going to highlight um, from a hardware perspective – that's um, there to make your team's experience better. All right, so let us go. Let's see if I can use my keyboard to the next slide. Nope, doesn't look like it. Okay. So I would like to do a poll. Um, this is, um, so forms um, and polls right inside of meetings is coming to GCC um, very soon. I'll, I'll cover that in my slide, but it's not there yet, so I can't integrate a poll yet. Um, this is a poll that is asking a little bit about your remote work. Um, when you open this up, it is going to ask for your first name, last name, and email, but I did not make those required fields because if you're uncomfortable posting, um, what I'm asking is 
are you how much are you working remotely is it 100 percent? is it less is it more than 50 percent? less than 50 percent? or are you back at the office if so do you have your own headset with a microphone do you have a good camera um and uh, and i think there's one other question i ask in there and what i'm really just trying to get a feeling for is how many of you are still working remotely oh yeah the last question was do you have kind of a a dedicated space or a quiet place to work, or are you working in the living room and the dog and the kids and everything else are going on? And again, I'm not going to use this information to talk to any of your agency, you know, leadership or anything. I'm just kind of trying to get a feel for where we are as a community with regard to where we're working. So if you don't mind filling that out, um, it's aka.ms TX Teams Community Eval. It also has the eval, like what do you think about the community ideas for future content? Um, but I moved that stuff down to the bottom and I prioritized the stuff at the top. So um, we'll revisit that poll toward the end and just kind of see um, what people are saying. So I want to also remind y'all about a resource that I covered last month. Um, this is Teams Meetings in GCC. I'm really trying to give a little more love to our GCC customers. Um, these are 11 sessions with deep dives on aspects of Teams Meetings using the features that are available in GCC. Because so much of the content that Microsoft creates um, has everything in it, like meaning commercial sector capabilities. And it's really frustrating to watch that and be get all like excited and then try to do it and it won't work in your tenant because you're GCC. So also, we are now doing another every week. We're doing four hours where we're going deep dive into a session on a particular topic around GCC specific capabilities. So we have a... Um, we have a playlist, this aka.ms slash teams meetings for government. If you go to this, it has the existing 11 sessions and then the additional sessions will be added to that. So really, really good content delivered by my peers. It's about an, um, each one's between 30 minutes and an hour long deep dive on capabilities. All right, so lots of good GCC specific stuff for y'all today. We'll, um, is Keith in the call? I haven't seen Keith in a while. Townsend, you hear Keith? No, he's about actually him. out. He's actually out today. Okay, because um, he normally sort of monitors the chat. If someone else can help me with that, and I, Billy's uh, answering some questions over there, just let me know if something, um, a link in the graphic was functional. Okay, good. Um, okay, wow, that's a lot of new features. So what I'm going to do is I'm actually going to switch over Actually, I um, didn't think about that. Let me let me bring up the other slide deck because what I want to do is I want to actually show you the slide deck that you're going to download um, and that you can get to. And um, give me just a sec here to bring that up because I'm using this new feature that you're about to get called PowerPoint Live. And um, PowerPoint Live gives you the ability to, okay, let me make sure I got the right one. Okay, PowerPoint Live gives you the ability to share just the PowerPoint. And the cool thing about that is the old way when you would share your screen and you would go full screen with PowerPoint, you would lose the ability to see the video of everybody. Well, right now I can still see y'all, I can still see the chat, and I can see the slides. So that's a really cool feature that's coming. Okay, so this is the slide deck. Included in the other deck, I'm going to include a link for where you download this. Okay, so don't um, worry about any you know, trying to scribble anything down or any of that kind of stuff. Um, I'm going to send you all the links afterward in the email. Okay, there's 61 slides in this. I'm going to go really quickly, but I um, so I'm not going to go into everything, but I, I just want you to kind of see the breadth of what's coming. And then if you have specific questions, throw them into the chat. And while Billy's going or while Mike's going, I can try to answer a few things. Um, Okay, so this is all stuff that's already shipped. So um, if you do a meet now, you can get a link and you can send that to somebody. Like if you want to meet with somebody and you want to send it in an email, then you can do that. There are real, some really nice new lobby settings. So um, you're going to have more granularity on who gets stuck in the lobby and who doesn't. So everybody in your organization can come through the lobby and bypass it. But then your guests can be, um, can be kept in the lobby. We're also adding the ability to pin an app in Teams. So right down here, you've got the little ellipse on the left rail, and you can pin an app, like um, you know, different uh, third-party apps or first-party apps, different capabilities, and you can just put them right here. Or when you click on that little ellipse, you can just drag and drop an app to the rail, and so you can pin it there so it's always available to you. 
We also have added some really nice, this is for your team's admins, capabilities in how you manage applications. And so before um, it was not um, as seamless, it was uh, better in the commercial cloud. You're now getting those same capabilities for managing apps. Those can be first party apps, third party apps, as well as custom apps. So um, really nice um, capabilities there for our admins. The other thing is your profile card. So um, the profile card, you can get your profile card by um, and looking at your contact information. But if you hover over someone in a chat, then you can get their profile card, including if you have your Active Directory set up, organizational hierarchies. You can um, find out information about which group they work with, get their phone number, their manager, all that kind of stuff. So it's really nice way that you can get quick information on one of your coworkers. Um, Let's see, let me get that to go away if I can. There we go. Um, did I miss one? Okay, the meeting creation experience. Um, this is um, the, a bit, whoops, sorry. Andre, your, your, yeah, I brought your card up and it just keeps showing up up here at the top. So there, now I finally got it to go away. Um, <laughs> so when you, um, let's see, let me make sure I can remember which one. Um, yeah, so if, um, as an administrator, you revoke someone's capabilities to schedule meetings, um, then um, these are some new capabilities for expiring meetings that they've already created. So it's just a control that if um, you know, someone loses privileges for some reason, um, then you're going to have more control there. Speaker attribution in live captions. This one is super cool. We've talked about it before. When you have live captions, whoever is talking at the time it will put their name and their picture right here in the closed captions so that you can see who is um, who is talking. Um, another super cool thing that is coming is that that is also going to work in meeting rooms with 10 people or less in the room when you have the new certified speaker phones that, um, that enable speaker attribution. So lots more information. And then if you don't wanna be identified, there's, um, there's an article here on how to do that. Um, so that is um, now live in GCC. Uh, and then also meeting support for view only attendees. So, um, oh, who was it that needed help with the, the big meeting um, coming up? Let's see. It was media that. and ethics. Yes, yes. Um, thank you. Sorry about that. Um, we are now able to scale meetings um, up to 20,000 view only attendees. So the first 300 come in a regular, just like a regular Teams meeting. But then um, anybody that joins after that is in a view only mode. And so this gives you the ability to scale your meetings up to very large numbers. Now, after July 1st, it's going to go back down to 10,000 view only attendees. That's still a lot of people. Um, and so lots more information about that. Um, we have also increased the granularity of controls so that um, you can set those meetings up and, and really control the, the meeting experience for your larger meetings. Um, the call recording policy, um, we've got some new PowerShell around the call recording. So who can um, record calls? And this is for one-on-one -on -one calls. And so um, if you're wanting to do things like record your one-on-one -on -one meetings with a manager or an interview or things along that line, that this is a particularly powerful feature for that that was not available before. Um, this you guys will probably like. Um, if you've ever been in a meeting or you, you were um, signed up to be in a meeting but you didn't get to attend the meeting but you got all the pop-ups, um, like lots and lots of pop-ups, um, the notifications. We've now simplified the notification settings. And so um, just go into your notification settings, go into uh, settings of Teams, and then go into notifications, and then you've got this new simpler interface to, um, to set your notifications. So much, much better. Um, we have the ability now to manage the attendee audio. And so um, if you want to... Uh, hard mute everybody. We've talked about that in the past. You can, if you have a big meeting and you want to hard mute everybody because someone keeps coming off a of mute accidentally or on purpose, then you can hard mute everybody. You can also select allow to unmute for an attendee, and then that enables them to unmute themselves. And so it's a much more granular control. So as our meetings get much larger, we need more granular controls to control that meeting process. And so this is one of those capabilities. 
Um, live event, never record. You can now set different policies for live events. You can have it always record, never record, or the organizer can record or not. Um, that was not a capability before. And so um, for those of you who do live events, I know that some of y'all are still doing quite a bit of live events. This can help with that, um, that control. Looks like sometimes. Okay, now these are pending releases. So these are going to be coming 2021 Q2. So in other words, over the next couple of months, there's some really cool stuff in here. So there's a new, uh, there's some new lobby settings. And so you're able to have more granular control of who can bypass the lobby. Um, we talked, there's, there was a feature that was already released. This is an additional capacity for who can bypass the lobby. Um, for Mac operating system, I think uh, someone mentioned Mac on the screen earlier. Um, so we're going to have um, more capabilities for Macs um, and changing the notification of Teams messages. And we also, uh, a CDN is a content delivery network. And so if you are doing um, very large scale meetings and you need to use a content delivery network because maybe you're, you're broadcasting all over the U.S., then uh, we have a partner organization called Ramp that can uh, now be integrated into that. And so that's for, um, for again, doing this third-party distribution. Here we go, meeting forms. So we're gonna have polls and meetings. So this gives you the ability right inside of a meeting to pop up a poll and get real-time feedback. It's great for engaging your audience. I would love to, once this is available in GCC, then I can use them in our meetings because if I if I set it up in my meeting and then you all join from a GCC tenant, you wouldn't be able to do it. And so this will now make it because y'all will have it in the GCC tenants, we'll have it in the commercial tenants. And so we um, we should be able to have um, polls in our meetings instead of just kind of using things informally or having to use a form like I did earlier. OK. Um, you're now also going to be able to prevent video sharing. This is another one of those capabilities for your larger meetings or even your smaller meetings where maybe you have leadership presenting to your organization and maybe you only have 50 people in the meeting, but you don't want anybody turning their video on. Well, you can do that now. You can set it so that they can't turn their video on. Um, we're also going to get um, what's called a dynamic view meeting stage. And so when I'm seeing this right now, um, where if, uh, depending on the number of people in the meeting, we have the, the, the seven by seven, you know, the, you know, the giant meeting where you can see tons of people in at the same time. We have the, um, the different views where the people are along the top, um, nine by nine. So depending on how many people are in the meeting, um, it will scale the layout to be most appropriate for the number of people in the meeting. Very cool capability to make it um, a, just a better meeting experience. So you're also going to be able to, if any of you are using Windows for your telephony system, then there's going to be some enhanced Teams calling experience built right into the Teams uh, meeting interface or the, the Teams interface. Um, I don't think many of us, uh, many are using that. Um, PowerPoint Live um, slide translation. So you're going to be able to have PowerPoint up and then you're gonna have live slide translation. So let's say we got a slide on the screen and you speak Spanish as a first language, you can literally translate the words on the slide to Spanish while I'm presenting. It doesn't affect my content at all, but you can see these are gonna be the languages that we're gonna release with. So when you're talking about your public facing meetings, this is gonna be a real key capability to be able to um, be more accessible for your audience. Um, customizable praise app. I had one uh, um, agency reach out to me um, just recently asking about praise. And so this is a way that you can um, praise your fellow employees. And so um, we've got some customization that is part of praise now that's going to be coming out. And uh, this will be sometime mid-May through end of May. This should be hitting. And these are some um, capabilities in the Teams Admin Center. And all you'll have to do is click on this link to read an article about that. Um, teams call merge. If you have two calls going on, you can bring those calls together now. So that's kind of cool. Um, I love this one. Multiple spotlights for Teams meetings. So um, when you're in a meeting, you can um, spotlight uh, one of the organizers or one of the presenters can spotlight someone's video. And so spotlighting puts them on the screen and leaves them on the screen. Well, you can now spotlight multiple people. So um, what this is, go this is 
coming toward a real deficit we've had in teams is our ability to have someone who is providing um, American Sign Language um, during the meeting. And so this would give you the ability to spotlight a person who is delivering American Sign Language and then your key, uh, your other person that's presenting. Um, we have some very, very powerful capabilities to do this using OBS Studio, but now you can do it a little bit easier inside of Teams. And so I think this is going to be great. Also, if you just have a panel of people that are speaking, you can um, simultaneously spotlight a maximum of seven participants. Now, spotlighting is for everybody. The organizer spotlights. Pinning means uh, you can do this for someone. Like, let's just say that I'm talking, and but Billy's on video also, and you want to pin video. You as an individual can pin a person to your screen, but the spotlight is done at an organizer level, and that will override pinning. And so, nice capabilities there. Supervised chat. This is kind of cool, kind of creepy, kind of cool. Um, if you have a chat where you need um, to have a supervisor that is in the chat, and um, so I'm going to read this. Supervised chat blocks restricted users from starting new chats unless an appropriate supervisor is present. When chat supervision is enabled, supervisors aren't allowed to leave chats and other participants aren't allowed to remove them, ensuring that all chats are properly supervised. If you have an environment where that's important, you know, it says this could be particularly good for educational institutions, this is going to be coming to you. Um, and if you're in a GCC tenant, um, it may already be in your EDU tenant. And it's off by default. So some of these things are off by default. Some, a lot of them are on by default. Another thing, this is great, especially for large meetings like this. If I open up the meeting attendees list right now, then it's going to just show everybody. It's going to be a long list. Now it's going to be sorted, and so it'll be 20 of the uh, – you got in the meeting, and then it's going to be 20 of the participants and then 20 of the presenters, and then you can open it up and see the rest. But what it also does is um, you can search, and so you can find a participant. So getting much, much better um, capabilities there. Now, I am noticing I'm already at 335, so I'm already eating into its billy time. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to stop presenting this part. Just know that there are 30 more slides of new things that are coming, and this isn't coming in the next year. This is coming in the next quarter. And so I'm very, very excited um, to kind of talk through some of these features. And now I'm going to hand it over to Billy for its billy time, and he's going to talk about actually some of these cool things that we can do. Take it away, Billy. Thanks so much, Michael. So as you heard, we have a lot of great features coming out with our new Microsoft rollouts. Um, but what I found was really important when we were discussing, me and Michael, about what um, it's Billy Time will be about this week um, was an article. It was an article in the New York Times. And the article in the New York Times discussed, um, it was actually somebody arguing why hybrid work would not work. And that was really strange for me. And the reason why is not because not only because I work for the hybrid work people, right? Um, but also because of the fact um, that that is what we hear from everyone about hybrid work and how it's gonna work and it's gonna be great and it's gonna save us, et cetera. And so um, the, uh, the, uh, the debater in me decided to read the article to see if we can combat it. And a lot of the things were around um, human nature and the human nature for us to connect with those who are directly with us. So if your team is 10 people and 50% are in the office and 50% are at home, the idea is that because of, not because of any intentional thing that you would do, um, but smaller um, incidental um, interactions with those who are around you regularly would cause you to bond more with those who are near you than those who are not, than those who are remote. And so what that encouraged me to do was focus on some of the, you know, I usually love to show you the flashy, the new things, the this this plane, this car can fly things. But today I want to focus on some of the smaller, more nuanced things um, that can help you run more efficient meetings, um, that can help you kind of make sure everybody else is engaged. And I also want to demonstrate some of the features that are going to be new to you here in this tenant that um, we have in Microsoft and that, um, I, as you most of you know, I came from UT Southwestern not even two months ago. Um, and so a lot of the features that you're just now getting, we had an opportunity to use for six months to a year. 
Um, and so it'll be because of our tenant, not because UT Southwestern is any particular, I mean, we're special, they're special, but not because it was a special tenant that we had, it was just the type of tenant that we had. Um, and so I wanna show you some of those features ahead of time and also give you um, some um, ideas on how you could potentially use them. So how does that sound? Everybody down? So this is the part where you say something. Sounds great. There we go. You know, listen, <laughs> I appreciate the engagement. There, there come the engagements at the bottom. Thank you for using your buttons. So give me one second while I share my screen. I'm actually going to share my whole screen daringly um, to show you some of the features that we have um, at our disposal. All righty. Here we go. And... Uh, Screen. All righty. So what you're seeing right now is my actual meeting screen, um, which is great. So I want to show you a couple of really, really cool things that you should keep in mind going forward. The first thing I want to show you is if you are the, um, this is just probably a pet peeve of mine, and so I want to help you help yourselves. Um, there was one time where um, I uh, had a meeting and it was right after a recent update, one of the updates that you now have. And I was done with the meeting and I was so used to the meeting ending, but this new update kept the meeting in a separate window. And when that happened, it did not automatically hang up when I went to another meeting. And so I came back 30 minutes after I had gotten off of my second meeting and realized that my meeting was still going. So if anybody had jumped into that meeting while I was still there, you know what would happen? They would have heard well, well, whatever I was saying in my house, whatever I was doing in my house. Luckily, I am an absolute angel outside of work. And I said nor did anything that would be embarrassing or compromising. <laughs> but that may not be you, right? He lies that about other things, you. too. So the first thing I want to show you is as an organizer, how you can save yourself and others. Now, most of you may know, but some of you may not, so it's worth putting on the recording. See how my button right here is a leave button? That's because I'm not the organizer. When you are the organizer, the person who set up the meeting, there is an additional button right next to this one that looks like a little down arrow, this little carrot. If you click there when the meeting is over, it'll give you an option to end the meeting. What does this do? This confirms that the meeting is over, and then it also will kick everyone out of the meeting space. This has a couple of benefits to you. The first is, you know how you get those notifications, like um, somebody's still in the meeting or you're getting these chats. It gives you an opportunity to kick everybody out so the meeting's over, but also it will signal to those who may be coming into the meeting, maybe late, that when they go to click the button on their calendar, it'll show that it's over. You won't have the, the computer button there um, that will uh, save you some time and headache. So I'm gonna show you what I mean in my calendar there. Give me one second. Here we go. So when you go to your calendar, it'll show you when a meeting is underway versus when it isn't. Um, and that can save you, again, a lot of headache. So when I go right here to my calendar, I can see that this meeting is underway. You see that? That's because it's red. And this, I also have a second meeting that's going on simultaneously, but this one isn't. So what that means for you is that means that these meetings are not taking place. So that means I don't have to can't, I don't have to click this particular meeting when I have let me go to one in the future. So if I want to go to this meeting, it's not highlighted, which means that there's nobody in the meeting. I don't need to click it to find out if it's over. I know that it's over, but that works only if you choose to um in the meeting. So that's option number one, really great benefits there. The second one is, as Mike, uh, Michael was referring to earlier, is pinning someone versus spotlighting someone. So spotlighting is really valuable, especially when you're sharing your screen. And so what I have the ability to do is to say, if Michael is speaking right now, if I want him to be seen, I can click the spotlight button. As you can see, it'll give him the majority of the screen as he's speaking. Why this is so, <laughs> why this is so valuable is because in those meetings where you're having huge meetings, giant meetings and you're not able, very often when I was having large meetings in my previous company I would use what's called Microsoft Teams Live and the reason why is because Teams couldn't really hold the amount of people that I was having in my meeting well that is changing slowly but surely and as Teams meetings like this one where you can interact fully with others starts to increase in size you'll want to ensure that the speaker that is talking is the person that everyone is seeing um, so that's what spotlighting does 
You don't use a spotlight in your house, right? You use a spotlight on the stage. And that'll help you remember the difference between spotlighting and pinning. I pin things to the wall in my personal office or my personal home because it's a personal preference. But we use spotlights. We want everybody to see the same thing. And so keep that in mind when you're going forward. In addition to that, if there's an additional person spotlighting, I can add to that spotlight. So if there's a back and forth conversation, this is really beneficial. I have the ability to spotlight Adriana. And so Adriana and Michael can be spotlighted simultaneously in your tenant that's coming. That's really, really beneficial, especially when you're sharing a PowerPoint, but Adriana got her camera off. So let me unspotlight just as easily. I can click the three dots and click stop spotlight. Now, there may be some times where you want to pin someone for your personal benefit. I will tell you that in the moments where you are wanting to evaluate um, maybe a new hire is in your in your meeting and you or somebody who's, um, you know, have shown that they might be feeling a little bit uh, separated from the group or someone who has a hard time speaking up or maybe it's your boss. I did this a lot. So I'm gonna give away my secrets because one of my VPs is on the call right now from UT Southwestern. And so I'm going to show you one of the things that I did and I hope you'll pick these things up when you have in your meetings. So when there were people who were decision makers or I was presenting, yes, ASL, that's correct. Pinning is great for ASL. Thank you for bringing that up, Joy. So if you have someone who is hard of hearing or deaf, um, then I can pin the ASL um, interpreter for themselves. It won't spotlight for everybody, but they can keep an eye on them. Absolutely. So let's say I um, have some decision makers in the room or I'm doing a presentation and there are certain people that I want to keep an eye on. I want to make sure they're engaged. I want to make sure they're along, going along with what I say. Well, if there's a ton of people talking and a ton of cameras on, it can fluctuate where they are if I see them at all. So when I choose PIN, what this does is this guarantees me that I will see Michael. Now, Michael does not know I have him pinned. It does not notify Michael that I have him pinned like it does with the spotlight. So when there were certain managers or VPs or executives in my meetings that I needed to make sure were, you know, feeling what I was saying, buying what I was selling, I used my pin to keep an eye on them the entire time. So all of these people will shift and all these people will move, but Michael will stay the same. So yeah, stealth pinning, stealth pinning is life changing. So now I'm keeping an eye on Michael and Mike because these are the two guys that I need to impress in this meeting. Or maybe Michael and Mike are my newest hires. So I wanna make sure they don't ever look confused or they don't ever look like I'm not getting it or I don't feel involved. So I can make sure I'm actively inviting them in to the meeting. So these are really great features that you can leverage that are already here. You can do it now as a matter of fact. It could be really, really beneficial to you. Um, so some just some recaps for the meeting that we have here. Leaving, pinning, and spotlighting are really, really valuable. Now I'm going to jump into some of the features that are going to come your way very soon that I think you're going to absolutely love. One of them is Microsoft Forms. If you've ever watched some of my Billy, it's Billy times, you know I am a fan of Power Automate and Microsoft Forms, one of my, two of my favorite tools. Well, Microsoft Forms now has a Microsoft Teams application function in which you can use forms inside of the Teams meeting to ask for polls. And then after the fact, I can look at those um, results. It's really awesome and it's perfectly integrated into the system. I'm going to demonstrate how that would work for you. So um, now that I'm sharing my screen, give it a second to, to jump up there. So I would go to my meeting chat. There's two ways to do the forms. I'm going to show you the, the easy ad hoc, really quick, um, moment way to do it first, and then I'll jump into some other ways second. So when I go here, um, you see I have my regular chat. I'll give them a second for my uh, my mouse to catch up there. All righty. So I could go here and I could type a chat um, business as usual. Give it a second to load. I'm sorry, it's taking a little bit a little bit longer than anticipated. My Wi-Fi can be a little slow sometimes. All right, here we go. So I have a couple of applications down at the bottom, which you're familiar with. Um, you'll soon be able to click the three dots there, the ellipsis. And then when you click the ellipsis, it'll ask you if you want to do any applications. So for some of you, it'll say messaging extensions. For others, it'll just pop up the application box that you're about to see now. Um, when that loads, I'll be able to search for applications. You'll be able to search for forms. I'm going to type forms, and forms is going to pop up. And so I can click forms and when that pops up, it's going to give me this screen that you're seeing now. And what will happen is it's going to give me the option after it finishes loading to create a poll ad hoc. Um, so
So once you, one of the things we love about Microsoft Forms is that it's smart, it uses AI. So because I have a question that is a, a yes or no question, it read it and recognized that, then it gave me yes or no options. But I don't want to give you the option to say no. I want to give you the option to say yes and heck yes. Let's do that. <laughs> Okay, and I can enable multiple answers. So if you're looking for more of like a poll, so you can get a percentage, I can click that and now you can pick whichever one, you can pick multiples at the same time, um, or I can make you pick one. I can choose to keep the result responses anonymous, and I can also choose to share the results or not. So if it's something that you wanna keep private, you have the ability to do that. I can also add additional options and buttons here, but just for the sake of time, I'm gonna go ahead and roll this poll out. And when I click save, it's gonna give me a preview of the actual card, and then I can click send. And once I click send, it's gonna send it in two places. It's gonna send it in the actual chat of the meeting, and then also it will send it to um, a pop-up card over the actual meeting. Um, so as you're talking, you'll see a pop-up there um, that adds a form. Now, for some of us in our different GCC um, um, tenants, you may not be able to see that form, and some of you may be able to interact with it. But I wanted to demonstrate for you from my presentation mode so that you can see how easy it is to do. Now, granted, my Wi-Fi is a little bit slow right now, so I apologize, but I wanted you to see how awesome it was. Now, one of the things that I like, and I'll show you in a moment, when you set up a Microsoft Forms, you can set it up ahead of time. So if there's some polling questions that you know you want to ask to get your audience engaged, you can set those up ahead of time in the meeting. So all you have to do is roll when you get ready. If I set it up ahead of time in the meeting, it'll put the Forms button right up here at the top. It'll be a little F, and I can click that and choose when to drop those polls. Um, so this is one of my favorite ways to interact. It's really great for um, getting everybody's um, input especially for those like myself who are extremely shy and don't like to speak up in meetings. You definitely want to have a mechanism for those of us that don't. So you can make sure that you hear everyone's voice. That's the goal. So hey, again, I want to remind question, you. Are, are y'all able to click on the form? Is it, it looks like we got 26 votes. So it looks like it's actually working. It's working. Yeah, yeah yes. we can actually see it and click on it. That's good to know. I did not know that worked cross cloud between the commercial tenant and a GCC tenant. So cool. So when I researched, it works. Don't get you. It probably won't always work. I was say it works most part in the chat, but for some in, in the, the chat, pop, it won't work. So the, the pop up that showed up on people's screens, not everybody saw that. But for the most part, everybody will be able to see it and experience it in the meeting chat, which is another reason why I like it because it sends it both ways. Um, so it gives you the opportunity also for those who are in the meeting that maybe come late. Um, or maybe are not in the meeting exactly, they can interact um, with it in the actual chat of the meeting as well. So one of my favorite things, now let's jump into the calendar function. Um, so I'm gonna make a meeting really quickly here. So if I set up a meeting, it'll allow me to set a meeting up business as usual, um, like you usually would. And I can name my meeting here, let's see, test. And then I wanna invite somebody, let's do that. Um, really quickly, sorry, my um, computer's moving a little slow there. Um, and what it will do is once you set up a meeting and maybe you um, are aware this is there, maybe you are not aware. So it's all about, um, you know, sharing the wealth of information. Um, so what it will do is when I finish setting up this meeting, it'll allow me to add additional applications to this meeting ahead of time, like I added forms just a moment ago. And so what that will do is that means that I will be able to set up some forms, set up some chats, set up some things like this ahead of time so that I have the ability to go in and interact with um, with those with those items ahead of time and then after the fact in my meeting wrap up. So I'm going to open this meeting. Um, you can test this out for some of your meetings that you currently have. Again, I don't believe Forms is available for you to embed in your meetings and your tenant now, um, but there are some other applications I'm sure that you can find um, beneficial to do. So once this finishes loading at the cross the top of the screen, what you'll see is you'll see um, some um, options for meeting notes, options to chat with those who are invited to the meeting ahead of time. It's a great way to let people know maybe what's coming up in that meeting or also to let them know, hey, when you come, make sure you bring a picture of your favorite vacation spot or make sure you change your background for this meeting for your ideal vacation location. Things like this that can make your meetings really engaging. Um, but the benefit that I want to show you here is if I click this plus sign, it'll allow me to add a tab to this meeting. Um, and one of the tabs, of course, that I want to add 
is forms. And so I'm going to go and search for forms. And once it finishes loading, I'll find the forms application the same way I found it a moment ago. The same way I found it a moment ago in um, the chat option as well. And when that happens, you'll be able to click the button and preset your um, preset your your questions for the meeting. So I'm going to click here and have that pop up just a moment and then I'll show you how to set those up. One of the things that I really love is that Microsoft Forms goes and guesses some things that you might want to add to the form based on what kind of meeting it is and your usual form productivity and suggest a couple of questions for you to add to the meeting. Um, and so what you'll find is when you go into forms, it'll actually already suggest to um, what you could call icebreaker questions, if you will, um, that can be used immediately. You just click save and then go into that. So we're going to give that a second to load. Um, one of the reasons I love Microsoft Forms as well is, as we've discussed in previous Billy um, Billy Times, as 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 named by Michael Kennedy and not myself, just for reference, um, you can see that you can use forms also to trigger events in Power Automate. This can be really, really valuable for you when you set up forms ahead of time to be able to trigger feedback um, or trigger uh, maybe some pre preset um, um, emails or calendar invitations. Um, and so you can go back to our YouTube channel that uh, Michael has and watch some of those previous meetings where I walk you through how to set it up step by step. Um, so that way you can use it in your own tenant if you might have missed it in the past. It's definitely worth a look. So what you'll see at the top of the meeting now is I can go into the chat ahead of time. I can load full files ahead of time. I can get into some meeting notes ahead of time, create a whiteboard, and now I can create my poll. And again, this is coming to you fairly soon. If I remember correctly from the PowerPoint, you should have this by, um, by uh, by the end of the next month or the month after. So this is relatively new. So start planning for how you can utilize these in your meetings now. Um, not just from an interactive point of view, but also from a professional point of view. Maybe there are some questions that you need to answer and you need to actually get people to vote on things. Well, if you don't keep the responses anonymous, you can have them vote and make sure you know who voted. You can also set it up where you have others to co-author, which means that others can add different options to the poll as well. Um, so there's quite a bit of um, really awesome suggest um, options here. Uh, let's see if I can get some poll suggestions here. How energized are you feeling today? How are you feeling today on a scale of one to five? That quick, I already have a form that's ready. I can also suggest other options. Um, and just like that, I can press save and roll those out in a meeting later. So those are definitely one of my, um, that's probably one of my favorite things in meetings now is that Microsoft, a Microsoft way to poll. Now, another thing that, while well, I have a couple of minutes left, another thing that was discussed in this particular article is how decisions are made in the workplace. And you and I both know that in some cases, some decisions are made formally, and there is a formal approval process, or there is a formal process that you go through to get things done. But in some cases, there are things where you just take something to someone, maybe hand them a piece of paper, have them write it, look over it, and, and, and take it back. Well, that might be a little bit, of, a little bit hard to do, in this hybrid workplace where maybe your supervisor or maybe the person who's senior on your team or maybe your timekeeper is no longer in the building. They're no longer three cubes down. They're no longer in the office upstairs. They're at home, but you may need to do something really quickly where you wanna get their approval or get their permission or get their eyes on something. There's an application coming to you very soon called approvals one of my favorite editions by Microsoft. Um, I've already pinned it over to the left for time. You know how you watch a cooking show and they like tell you all the things and then they have it already made? This is that moment. Um, you can always click this three ellipses when it rolls out and I'm sure Michael will let you know when that is. Um, and then you can search it there and attach it right there to the left, pin it to your, um, your screen. But I'm gonna go ahead and open it. What do we love about approvals? Approvals allows for you to submit a approval request um, via Microsoft Teams. It's essentially what it is. Um, now, what I want to say is that it is what you make it. So am I suggesting that you send, you know, the, the Department of Justice starts sending, uh, you know, I don't know, 
federal document. I, I don't know how you, I'm not gonna tell you what to send or how to send, but I do wanna show you the functionality. Why do I wanna show you the functionality? Because without knowing all of the things high level that you can do in your government tenants, what I do know is at the smaller levels, things like paper requests, or um, can I do this with my desk? Small things where you wanna be able to track that somebody said yes, or you wanna make it clear that it's semi-professional, you can do it here. Now, if you are on this call and you have the power to revamp your entire business processes based on things in Teams, more power to you. I'd like to remind you of the extreme security of Microsoft applications, including HIPAA and FERPA and all manner of sort of security that you can count on Microsoft Teams to keep your stuff safe. A Microsoft Teams in some ways is the, Microsoft, excuse me, in some ways is the largest security company in the world because we're responsible for safeguarding tons of data from federal all the way down to small businesses and bakeries and everywhere in between. Um, so I'd love for you to explore those options for you. But first, I want to just show you how it works. So you have two ways of using approvals. You can start from the approval application like you saw I just did. Also, and I'll show you before I leave, in the actual chat, there is an approval button there. So if you're in the chat, you're chatting with someone, you have the ability to send them an approval right there in the chat. It doesn't have to be in the meeting and it doesn't have to be standalone. So really quickly while you're talking to someone or you're in a Teams meeting, you can shoot that approval forward um, for maybe a model and have that done off of your plate. How does the approval process work? You simply click new approval request. It'll pop up a button for you to fill out all the information. What I love about the approvals is it's ad hoc. What do I mean when I say ad hoc? I decide the approval or approvers. So sometimes it may not be an approver. I'm using the approval function to ask somebody to um, check something off. Yes, they had their eyes on it, for instance. So I can go here and choose who approves it. That's best. And I can choose multiple people. And as you can see on the screen, require responses from all of those approval approvers or just one. So of course, I'm going to ask um, one of my favorite people. See, there was no qualifier at the end of that. Just one of my favorite people, if teams will find them while they're searching. And I can go in and click Michael Kennedy. It brings to you the power of your amazing Microsoft address book so that you can search your internal um, people and find it really easily. Um, so I'm going to send something to Michael Kennedy. I can choose what kind of request it is. Um, so a basic or is it an e-signature? I can name the approval. And then I can go down and give as many details as I need to in the bottom. So again, I want you, while you're watching this, I want your brain to start thinking about what problems can this solve for you in your business? How can I go digital first? What paper can I get rid of within reason, within availability in my tenant that I can start using this process for, have it digitized, have it followed, be able to refer to it again, be able to audit it after the fact. Um, so I can add those attachments and I can also choose what kind of response. So if I don't press anything, it'll give the person an approve or deny button. But if I click custom responses, I can go in and choose what they click. Maybe I say uh, send forward. Maybe I say pay or don't pay. Maybe I say buy or don't buy. Maybe I just have a yes or no button. So this again is why I say it's called approvals, but it didn't always have to be an approval. So in this particular case, I want to ask Michael if I can buy this. You know, just so you know, I like to have a maybe a tentative um, informal request to buy before I start the actual formal process required by my institution to buy something. So I know if I'm going to get denied or not, or if I need to change something ahead of time, I can do all of those things here. So I can do that. I can send it to a different environment, which we'll skip now. And I can also add an attachment. So maybe I want to attach that um, that uh, sales ad I saw, or maybe I want to attach a uh, quote that I would usually email, but this allows them to have it actionably. The thing I love the most is that this is going to create a Teams activity and a Teams card on Michael's computer. So um, I guess my um, Wi-Fi is working a little bit hard this time, but what will happen is it'll create a little box at the bottom of Michael's um, computer that lets him know that there's an approval to him, and it'll also come to him in a Teams chat form, and then he can approve it or deny it, and when he does, I'll get that same notification. But I'll always be able to go here and see all of the request approvals that I've received and all of the approvals that I've sent. Um, so that's a really great benefit there. And finally, just a little bit of, you know, razzle-dazzle for you guys. Everybody does a good job at some point. Everybody does. 
And so when you want to share with someone about how good of a job they're doing, there's also another application called Praise. Um, maybe you've experienced it, maybe you haven't, but for those of you who haven't, I want to show you this right here at the bottom. It's a little icon right there that looks like a little badge. I can click that badge or I guess I could if I actually clicked it. And when I click that badge, what it does is it pops up an option for me to pop up a adaptive card of praise. It's a really great way to give formal, informal praise maybe in a Teams. So if you have a Teams for your entire department or maybe a channel dedicated to just having you know, coffee talk, you have the ability to go in and click that praise button and then it pops up some card options. It allows you to attach it to a person so they get notified. And also it allows me to type in what they did. Uh, so I can click the awesome card. And then what it does is it allows those people who like to be praised in public it allows you, like, I don't know any of those guys. It's definitely not me. Um, then you have the ability to do praise in public. You also can do it privately in a chat. Just let them know you saw what they did. Thanks for taking care of that customer, et cetera. Um, so I know my machine's moving a little slow, and I think I'm three minutes over time. So I'm going to pause here for now. Um, if you like some of the things that you saw or there was a different um, function that you'd like to see, such as PowerPoint Live, um, I'd love to come back next Billy time. Feel free to drop some suggestions in the chat, and we can do those those things, those demonstrations for you later. So Michael, did we get any interesting questions while I was demonstrating? Uh, we did, and I was uh, answering as we went along. Okay, perfect. Thank you. All right, well, with that, I'm going to stop sharing my screen, and thanks for coming to Billy time. <laughs> Thank you, Billy. Thank you, Billy. That was boring, that was boring as, usual. as usual. I'm so sorry. I'm working on it. <laughs> I'm working on engagement. <laughs> I'm gonna get it together someday, Michael. I know, I know. One of these we Microsoft all, trainings will be about engagement, I'm sure. We all have we all goals. Have all right, so let me bring back the slides and um, I'm gonna share back out the deck and then I'm gonna welcome Mike Rogers. Give me one second to get this up here. Okay, it started at the beginning, so Give me a sec here and I'll go to the correct slide. So um, Mike, why don't you go ahead and introduce yourself and what your role is at Microsoft while I'm getting to the right slide. Yep, hey everybody, Mike Rogers here. I have been with Microsoft for 12 years and I have been in the Surface world within Microsoft for about six in different capacities. Um, supporting the state of Texas during that entire time, again, in different capacities. And uh, as Michael and I were chatting, he said, hey, can you come and just share a perspective of kind of what are we seeing as far as devices in connection with Teams as customers are trying to figure out this whole world of remote work? And so, you know, just know you're going to see some, some slides in here that have a lot of pictures of Surface devices. Uh, a lot of this information would apply for non-surface devices. Um, and so, you know, I want to just provide a perspective and share some customer stories. Um, so yes, I have slides, uh, but really it's going to be interactive. You're going to find that there's almost no, you know, words or anything on any of the slides as we go through this. Um, so yeah, Michael, if you're ready. Yeah. So, so since, we're, since we're having fun here, so so one thing, if something I say does not make sense, it is because I have a newborn at home and she does not like sleeping some nights and last night was one of them. So I will warn everybody in advance. And then- uh, on Mike, top you need of that, some bussin' coffee. That's what you the need. The problem, problem is the way my body works, if I have too much, then I get like this during presentations, right? So <laughs> that you gotta balance it. Um, Right before I jump into the content, I'm going to uh, to show my nerdy side. I'm curious if anyone else had. A, yeah, thanks, Joy. If uh, let's see if anyone uh, was a nerd like I was growing up and uh, carried a bunch of pocket PCs and a little belt clip on their uh, on their side. Um, so I went through an exercise about three or four years ago of cataloging all of the phones that I had owned. And uh, this is what I came up with. You'll notice, obviously, a lot of Microsoft-centric phones. Uh, it's pretty crazy to see how much this has evolved, thinking of just T9 texting at the beginning um, to now, you know, the power that we have in our pocket. Um, you know, I'll share a little bit about the Surface Duo, but Microsoft is painting a vision even beyond the phone. Yeah, I see some Palm Pilots. There we go. Yeah. 
Palm Pilot 5X, baby! Yeah, so, you know, we've all always wanted the ability to have full connectivity while we're remote. Uh, there you, oh man, yeah, I have some in the, I have some in, I have a, a little drawer of stuff that I, I say will someday go in a museum in our basement. Uh, the Zune is down there as well, in case anyone's wondering. So uh, I still I still have a Zune and a Zune HD. Um, but you know, for those that have been following along, you know, eight years ago, uh, Microsoft got into the business of not only making software but making hardware. Um, the main reason for that is that we want to be a leader and be able to showcase our software and our hardware together. And so as we're building hardware, we're, we're thinking about how is Teams going to work well on this device? Um, how is Azure Windows Virtual Desktop going to work well on these devices? Um, how can we take advantage of what we're doing in software and make that available to our customers in hardware? And so that's something that we set out to do. Uh, but many of you may not even realize that that portfolio of devices has grown from you know, a single device at launch um, to now this entire family of devices that you see here. And what's been really interesting to me over the last um, year and a half, which is crazy to say that, I guess a year and two months since a lot of us uh, went into some type of quarantine, is that these devices were built from the beginning for the world of remote work. We've been talking about mobility being something that means more than just being able to you know work out in the field but mobility means being able to, to work from where you need to work um, you know many of our devices are designed um, to be able to support this world of remote work and many of the devices from you know our uh, our partners as well are, are really starting to catch up and have a lot of these same features that you just really need in a remote work world i'm going to so, go forward on the slides mike yeah, that'd be great. So before I jump into scenarios, and this kind of aligns to some of the questions that you may have seen in, in Michael's poll, um, you know, the world of remote work requires a different set of hardware. Like, put something in the chat or give me a thumbs up if your organization's primary computers that they issued were desktops two years ago. I'm going to, yep, there we go. I see, yep, they're coming in. You know, I've been working in state and local for six years, and, you know, desktops made up about 60 to 70% of my customers' computers. And so it was a really awkward conversation to have about, you know, 14 months ago when all of a sudden you had to send people home. You know, I had customers that were literally sending those desktops and computer uh, monitors and all of the components home with people uh, or asking people to use a personal computer and finding ways to secure those devices uh, so that they could be effective at working. Um, the ones that transition more quickly to laptops and tablet form factors, it was, you know, a bit easier to be able to take those home. Uh, but then it becomes, you know, how productive are you going to be from home? You know, if you are living your workday in Microsoft Teams, taking advantage of all these features that Billy and Michael have been talking about, uh, you know, you want to be able to have a high-end camera. You want to have quality speakers. Um, you want those microphones that are on the device to be able to actually pick up your voice clear enough so that you get the translation levels and the narration levels that Michael was alluding to earlier. Um, that's super important. Yeah, there's plenty of devices out there with a microphone, uh, but does it work well enough to capture that audio in a way that the computer can understand those words and turn them into text uh, for people that are remote to be able to, to see that? So uh, again, that's a vision that we've been painting for a while. Another piece of that is uh, is being able to take advantage of pen and touch. Um, you know, we're all used to being able to physically be in a room together. And uh, when we're together, it's easy to get on a big physical whiteboard. But now we're trying to figure out how to do some of this stuff uh, remotely. And uh, being able to take advantage of a software whiteboard uh, can be really valuable. But if you have a device that doesn't support pen or touch, Michael and I were just talking about this earlier. Are you going to use your mouse cursor on the whiteboard to try to interact with people? Um, so we have to think of new ways to bridge that hybrid gap where there's going to be some people that are going to continue working remote, 
and some people that are going to be in an office. Um, and I expect that to be a common trend uh, for a long time now. Yep. Yeah, Joy, I see your point. Yeah, I completely agree. Um, so yeah, let's go ahead and transition to the next one because I want to be able to tell some stories. And I did see, I want to address it. Uh, Michael, did we address the whiteboard question that I think Chris Bunton had? Yeah, about? so um, Chris, I did see your question about whiteboard. Um, I, I do believe it is still slated for the June timeframe. Um, I want to be super transparent with you all, um, which is a, a pretty sad thing. Um, uh, our team, uh, we have a lot of developers in India, and our team is being really hard hit by, um, if you've been keeping up with the news, this really virulent um, strain now of the um, Corona 19, uh, I'm sorry, the COVID-19 virus. And we have team members who've literally like lost both parents um, to COVID in the last three weeks. And so it is a huge problem and it is actually impacting our ability to deliver features. Um, we are keeping an eye on um, these capabilities or these features and um, I'll, I'll try to keep you up to date. Uh, I'm not saying that when it will be impacted. I'm just saying that um, it's um it, you know it's a global village now and um and we're we're really um uh, really challenged in uh, in that part of the world for um resources and uh, it it's it's bad yeah so not to be Debbie Downer but um it we could um, lose some of our timelines on some of these capabilities yeah so and and hopefully I'm not jumping the gun on it but the announcement that you'll see soon if you haven't already in Message Center will be that the whiteboard for government cloud will be coming to web and within teams only when it first launches. So like Michael said, uh, the current target is sometime next month. Um, and then the features where you'll actually be able to sign in on the Surface Hub like you see below me or behind me, as well as the Windows 10 application that will come at a later date uh, this calendar year. Uh, if you have an NDA, uh, we can set up a roadmap discussion where we can go a little more in detail one on one uh, but that's kind of the broad guidance that I can share today because that comes up a lot. Uh, I love the whiteboard and it's hard to not have that feature available yet in government cloud. So I want to pause for a second before I talk about these, uh, a couple of stories from some of my customers in unique ways that they're using uh, devices and teams together uh, and ask if there are any questions. If anyone wants to come off mute or feel free to put questions in the chat. I see a lot of chatter back and forth. Really cool to see that a lot of folks have already transitioned to laptops in your organizations. Uh, just know that there are a lot of others that have not uh, that are working on catching up. Yeah, thanks all right. for all that feedback in the poll, y'all. Really appreciate that. I'm not in the poll, but in the uh, the chat. Yeah, a lot of feedback in the chat. Really appreciate it. So uh, the first example and story that I'm going to talk about is leveraging the Surface Hub with Microsoft Teams together. Um, is anybody, give me a thumbs up if you're familiar with the Surface Hub. Uh, it's actually the device that's behind me right here. Okay, so we have some. Um, you know, Microsoft built the Surface Hub about five years ago because we were trying to address a problem that we saw, which is, you know, we've all been in that meeting, we come in, trying to figure out who's got the dongle, who had the presentation, how do we do it in this room, who's got the conference ID. Uh, we really wanted to bring the hardware and the software together in a unique way that solved that challenge and made it super easy to do conferencing uh, as well as collaboration. Since then, Microsoft has also introduced a whole series of third party devices called Team Room Systems, uh, which you may be familiar with. And so a similar idea behind the team room systems just from our third party ecosystem, the idea being how do we simplify uh, that meeting experience for those users. Uh, and with team room systems, as you can see in the slide here, uh, you can actually you know, put together these systems that are kind of pre-baked for different sizes. Um, you know, it might have two speaker phones, a camera, an on-table uh, control device that allows you to click one touch join into a meeting like you would on the Surface Hub. Uh, and depending on your meeting room and your meeting room needs, uh, it may require a Surface Hub, team room systems, or a combination of both. Um, and uh, Michael and I are happy to go deeper on that, but I wanna jump back to the, to the Surface Hub piece and talk a little bit about this. So I have 
now about uh, four customers that have uh, 75 Surface hubs or more in their environment. Um, and for anyone that knows kind of the starting price of these devices, you may be going, how did they pull that off? Uh, and really it started with them purchasing one or two of these devices and really understanding what the value of that device was. But one story that I really wanna talk about uh, is actually a state court system that I have. Again, not in Texas, uh, I wish it was, uh, but this court actually began using Teams and Surface Hub together uh, to be able to bring in remote attendees. They found that there were times where they wanted to bring in an expert witness. Maybe they even had a child who had been abused by somebody and they didn't want to be in the courtroom. Uh, there were just a lot of folks that they wanted to be able to bring in remotely and they wanted to simplify how that happened. And so for them, it was rolling a Surface Hub like you see on the left side into the courtroom. Uh, the meeting that they were in was already pre-staged so they could one click be into that team's meeting. And that was actually how they bring in remote participants. Well, here COVID hits and they shut the courts down uh, other than essential personnel. Nobody can come in. They were ready. They said, hey, let's buy 70 more Surface Hubs. Uh, we really want to be able to roll this out to every court across the entire state. And, uh, and they did. And they've had a ton of success. Uh, because now they're able to hold court sessions where there's a few people in the room, but everyone else is via Teams. They've actually even had uh, entire sessions where everybody was on Teams. Um, so it gives them a lot of flexibility by combining that hardware and that software story together. Yeah, Mike, I've also, um, we were literally just on a call earlier today um, with another um, devices partner, and they were talking about um, the cost of moving um, someone who is in a in, in who is incarcerated and is in a and maybe in a high security prison and you need to move them um, for a trial and the cost of setting up the security and you know the detail that's going to go along with the transport vehicle and and there's just a huge amount of cost and when they started looking at the number of cases they were doing it was an it was very easy to afford uh, and Michael uh, Mike what's the kind of MSRP on so the one behind me, the 50 inch is $9,000, but that's the all of the components needed. It has microphones, camera, pen um, already in the box. Yeah. And so they, they looked at that and they're like, okay, yeah, that makes economic sense for us because of the cost of moving um, prisoners around. And so, it, again, it seems like a lot of money until you start comparing it to the alternative cost. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, so many different use cases. Uh, you know, I have a fire department that uh, purchased 70 of these and put one in every fire department across the state, or sorry, across their county. Uh, and that is now the primary way that they communicate from site to site. They just jump on a quick Teams call and they can work together um, at any point and any time. Uh, I also have city council and mayors that are using the Surface Hubs to actually participate in public city council meetings as well as for their own internal meetings. Again, it's all about that ease of use, uh, making it really easy, having the high def camera already built in, uh, even being able to collaborate and, and you, you take advantage of the pen and all the other features. So any questions on this before we move on to the next story? OK. Michael, let's go ahead and jump on to the next one. So we talked a little bit about team room systems. Another example that I see is field workers. Um, you may have in your organization people that do work in the field primarily, even pre-COVID, and it was challenging to figure out what device was going to be a good fit for them. Um, you know, mobility and portability of a device are super important, but then you still want a full set of features in the field. Uh, and so we've had a number of uh, examples within caseworker um, and child services organizations where they've turned to uh, two-in-one devices from Microsoft uh, for those specific use cases. And I think what's really interesting about them is it's one thing to buy a Surface and use it as a desktop replacement, plug it into a dock, you know, use it like a traditional Windows 10 PC. The real magic comes when you actually start using all of the features that are available on this device. And so one of those specific child services agencies uh, actually went all in. They bought Surface pins to go with each of their Surface Pros with integrated LTE. 
and they started using OneNote as a primary way uh, that they would be able to keep all the notes as they were meeting with kids. Uh, they found that when they were spending time with kids that were in foster care, to sit down in front of them and pull out a laptop, it creates this physical barrier between them and those kids. And it was not very natural. And so they were looking for a new way that would feel like pen and paper, but that would allow them to actually have a digital device, a digital record and access those records at any time. As well, they would be able to use, uh, at the time, Skype for Business, um, now Microsoft Teams, uh, to be able to interact with any of their coworkers or peers that they needed to get information from. Um, so it gave them all those capabilities because of the microphone, the camera that are all built in uh, and the pen capabilities uh, to do all that in a way that really transformed the way that uh, they're working with these kids. Uh, so you're talking about real impact. This isn't just, uh, hey, we bought a different type of laptop. Um, it actually changed the way that they work with their constituents, which is really cool. Uh, but there's a number of use cases within health and human services and, and other organizations as well uh, where it's been super valuable to transition to a two-in-one. Any questions on that? So this is one that I didn't see coming and it actually has been really cool to be a part of some opportunities where customers are exploring this. Um, Give me a thumbs up again if anyone that's on here has leveraged uh, thick clients within their organization. Got to be some. OK, there we go. I was like, there's got to be some thin clients. So how many of you have thought about using a Surface Laptop Go or a similar, you know, full laptop as a modern thin client? Give me another thumbs up. Yeah, so I don't see as many thumbs up. It's been really interesting because I've had customers that have looked and said, what's the total cost that I spend on those thin clients? By the time I buy the terminal and then I buy a monitor and I buy a mouse and I buy a keyboard and I buy a webcam, uh, I piece all that together and I have a solution that can be pretty expensive in total cost. Um, and so I have customers that are actually saying, hey, you, know, you guys are now offering a surface at a lower price point that would allow me to use that with Windows Virtual Desktop uh, in the same way that I would a thin client. Uh, but in this case, I have a full fledged computer. And so what's really cool about that is unlike a thin client, I'm no longer attached to a desk. My modern thin client now goes with me wherever I want to go. And what's really cool about using uh, Windows Virtual Desktop uh, and running Windows 10 is that you then have the ability to take advantage of a lot of optimizations that we've done for Teams. And so um, I actually have a laptop Go that I use Azure Windows Virtual Desktop on, and I can run Teams and take advantage of my microphone and speaker that are on that device and through media optimization for Teams, uh, which is supported in GCC. I actually have a high fidelity Teams experience on a virtual desktop on even the lowest end Surface Laptop Go. Um, that device starts at about $650 MSRP uh, for the total package. Uh, and so that's a really compelling solution that a lot of my customers are exploring as they try to think about how do we get those folks that had a thin client attached to a desk, how do we help them work remotely without having to go spend $1,500 on a laptop bundle and a dock? Mm. Um, so any any questions on that one? All right, Michael, let's go ahead to the next one then. And Mike, I threw those slides in there about the proximity okay. stuff. I, and yeah. I apologize, I don't think you you probably didn't see that those were in there, so sorry about that. I didn't, it's all good, yeah. So, so Michael and I were talking about, so there's some features in Teams that are really cool. Uh, one of them called Proximity Join and another one called uh, Coordinated Meeting Join that have recently been released to GCC as well. Uh, the Coordinated Meeting Join one is really interesting. Uh, we can talk about proximity based as well. Proximity based uh, is essentially it recognizing, hey, you walked into a room that has a team room system or a Surface Hub. Um, and we see that you're in a meeting. Do you want to transfer it to the the device in the room because you want to you know likely take advantage of the bigger screen and all of the you know microphones and cameras that are in there? 
Um, so that's a really cool feature that is, is available today uh, that can be set up. Yeah, Tony, I see one person's having issues with seeing the slides. I see Michael's slides. Hey, why don't I, um, I will stop um, sharing the slides and then I'll, I'll start sharing them again. Okay. I'm actually seeing, yeah, it may have, um, it may have stopped sharing. So let me, let me show that again. Sorry about that, Tony. Thank you for letting me know. And I think I just picked the wrong slide deck. <laughs> I did. Hey, why don't you go ahead and keep talking about the um, the the proximity join? Yeah, so, yeah the other feature um, that I was talking about was called a coordinated meeting join. That can be really valuable because I was talking about how you know there's team room systems and there's Surface Hub. The question becomes, what if I want to combine both of those in the room because I want to use one component for a specific task like the audio for the room, but I want to use the Surface Hub for the whiteboarding uh, and the collaboration piece. And coordinated meeting join actually allows me on the back end to create a connection between those devices and specify which of those tasks each of those devices is going to facilitate in that room. Uh, so a really helpful feature as you think about larger rooms where you might have uh, both of those systems operating together. I think this is just the same slide about the same um, yeah. feature. Yep. Um, another cool feature is um, the uh, one touch or zero touch. Um, some people do um, as we come back into the workspace. Um, you know, there's a lot of concern about you know who's touching what and who touched what, and so that proximity join could be very handy because you could join the meeting from your phone and never touch anything in the room. Um, you also have the ability to do one touch join on devices like this. A uh, device that could be on a table or could be mounted on the wall. And so a one touch join allows you to touch something once and it could be a surface that can be easily wiped down and sanitized. And so um, we're really trying to think through um, how you give a safe meeting experience. Um, there are some other capabilities that are really important um, with regard to the hybrid um, in that. Uh, and let me quickly go over here to um sorry mike let's see um yeah so um we did make some announcements about some speakers where um earlier i spoke about the um the captioning with user attribution and so there are microphones uh, i'm sorry yeah there's microphones now that you can put in the middle of the room and it has multiple microphones it's a speakerphone with multiple microphones, and it gives you the ability through training the microphone to recognize who is talking. This only supports up to 10 people in the room, and it can only be a meeting up to 30 people total in the meeting. But that's a lot of meeting scenarios that are supported where um, – where you have 10 people in the room, you got 20 people joining from remotely from their home office or wherever in the world they are, and everybody's getting speaker, speaker attribution and the transcript records who is speaking. You do have the ability to correct that during the meeting if someone's speaking and it says speaker X, and so you can say, oh, that's this person. You also have the ability to remove um, people from that, like you don't want to give speaker attribution to a particular person. Um, if you needed to do that for some sort of privacy purposes, then you have that uh, ability to do that. Um, another really cool um, thing that we have with both the Microsoft-based room systems as well as partner room systems is um, you have all these different hardware devices that are Teams certified. This is a particular partner. I'm not calling them out to Microsoft endorse them, but just say there's a lot of variety here. There are also, um, there's, uh, there's Jabra, there is uh, Poly. So there's a whole lot of partners that have these. I was actually just on a call earlier today Day, so I had some of these slides. Um, and then there's some that you don't have to install into the room, but they're just USB solutions. So you plug in your laptop into it, but it's a true room system that just plugs in and uses your laptop, your teams as the experience. And so that can be much simpler. And um, these room systems that come from Yaylink, um, they go PoE, power over Ethernet, so you don't have to put in a whole bunch of cables and all kinds of fancy HDMI cables and all that kind of stuff for these different cameras. They actually just need a Cat5 cable running to them, and they even have a solution 
where you can have multiple cameras like a city council setting like this or a courtroom setting, multiple cameras that are pointing at the different um, members um, of the, uh, the, the city council. And then they have a little software all contained in the devices that it's called muxing together the different video signals from the different cameras and makes it one video feed coming into the team's meeting. And so it, it truly gives you this, um, this view of everybody in the room. And then you could have a third um, camera or multiple cameras up to nine that would be pointing at maybe like a, you know, maybe this is uh, something for a city council meeting, or maybe this is something like evidence for a courtroom setting or, you know, whatever the case might be. But you now have the ability to put multiple cameras and, but, um, and I asked him the question, does that mean you're taking up all the bandwidth of like six cameras or three cameras or four cameras? And he said, no, it muxes it together into one video signal, which is, um, which is pretty darn cool. Um, I recognize we are at, we're actually about two minutes over time. And so, um, I would like to keep going for those who do need to leave. Totally understand that. Um, we just have a couple more slides that we want to go through um, on the some of the hardware that's going to be coming and some future scenarios. And so if you need to leave, thank you so much for joining. Um, and if you're able to stay, then we'll just keep going and I will have the recording and I'll post it to our YouTube channel afterward. So um, Mike, why don't we talk a little bit about what's coming and some of the cool scenarios that we see coming. Yeah, absolutely. So um, this next two are, are going to be devices that are actually in market. But when I think about how broadly I would expect them to see them adopted in public sector at this point, you know, I think that the, the uh, opportunity to have, you know, thousands of surface duos out there is unlikely. But the idea is really unique because when you think about um, back in the day, you know, imagine the first time somebody at your desk said, hey, you can have two monitors. And you started working and the productivity boost went way up because all of a sudden you were able to do two things at once and have them up in real time. That's essentially the idea that we're trying to bring to the mobile phone space uh, with the Surface Duo uh, and this device that is somewhere between uh, you know, a two in one and a phone, but having two screens. So you know, I can actually have an app group on that device where I click and Outlook and Teams pop up at the exact same time. Uh, and so I can have a video call going while, as you see in this example, you know, I have a PowerPoint that I'm presenting from that I can see live as well. Um, mm -hmm. So I think this could be something that would be extremely valuable. You know, imagine again, a caseworker um, and they're out in the field and they have their case notes up on one side and on the other side they have teams running uh, all in a device that they can fold up and fit inside of their pocket um, instead of carrying you know a two-in-one or whatever device that they have today so i bring this up just to be kind of let's just start the conversation you know this is a platform that microsoft is going to continue investing in and i would expect to see more devices like this uh, start to hit the market as well and Mike, is that running Windows 10? It is not. Yeah. So believe it or not, it is running Android uh, on that device, but you can still run all of your Microsoft applications on there as well as the same security software. So even, you know, being able to hook it up to Intune as well as running Defender ATP, um, the same type of security tools that you use within your IT environment, you can use to manage this Surface Duo. And I know Billy wants to mention something. I can see you, Billy. <laughs> no, mine, I was just going to say mine is in the mail, but the Surface Neo that I've literally been waiting on for years and is 50% of the reason I joined Microsoft to see if I can find one laying around. <laughs> also excited about that. That it's a Yeah, so it, for anyone that hasn't seen a duo in person, there's that app group that I talked about. And so now I have, if it's not too reflective, both Teams and Outlook running at the same time all on this super thin device that now I can put in my pocket. So super cool. Nice. All right, well, let's jump to the last one. Let me actually go here first, Mike, and just um, talk yeah. really quickly about the, yeah. That's great. Yeah, so Microsoft last month, at the same time as we were announcing the Surface Laptop 4, which actually started shipping last month as well, we launched a whole new set of uh, team certified devices uh, from the Surface headphones to just the Microsoft branded uh, wireless uh, headset. We have a wired headset. There's now a speaker puck. Uh, there's a camera. 
all of these devices, like some of the third party ones we talked about, are part of a certified for teams program. Uh, so they are vetted and tested to work well with teams. They have buttons that make it super easy um, to join your calls. Um, yeah, super great products. Uh, most of these devices that you see, these accessories will launch at the middle of June. So keep an eye out, they'll be available soon. And then uh, finishing with what I think is one of the coolest things we have ever in, in ever created and is just changing the game in ways that we can enable so many scenarios. Yeah. Um, HoloLens has been something that I've been super fascinated by for a very long time. Um, for anybody that didn't see the news, you know, the, the biggest investment I've seen so far in mixed reality uh, in the HoloLens actually came recently from the U.S. Army. Uh, the U.S. Army announced a $22 billion deal uh, with Microsoft around mixed reality, uh, AI, and some other things that were happening there. Uh, but the HoloLens, you know, in my mind is starting to become more mainstream. So the picture that you see here, you know, imagine somebody that's out in the field um, and they need to, to talk to an expert and that expert is somewhere else. And so you want that expert to be able to not only see what you see, but you want to be able to be there with them. And so that's the idea with the HoloLens is this entire headset there's no wires, there's no nothing. That's the entire computer and it's actually projecting an image on top of your actual line of vision um, so that you can see these things. So again, a super unique way that you can leverage Teams or in this example they're showing is Teams within Dynamics um, to be able to, to have remote people uh, getting advice from experts interacting with people that are not there uh, in a really cool way. Yeah, and you can use this um, scenarios like service um, for, um, you know, if it was the prison system, it could be service of um, remote facilities. If it is um, highway department, it could be um, doing inspections and, and putting IoT devices on bridges for um, vibration sensors. It could be any range of applications where you need to show somebody else what you're seeing and the person who is like literally she is looking and she sees this video it's not really there um and she still sees the, the this device with all the wires in it and the person who is this expert can see what she sees and can even say okay well look look right there at the wires and she's going to circle cut that wire that stops the bomb from detonating you know no not that wire the wire to the right yeah that wire um and so I'm just kidding about that scenario, but um, no. it, yeah. Yeah, no, yeah, one, one other one that I would share is, uh, so for those that use Esri ArcGIS, uh, so VGIS has built a HoloLens application that can tap into that data uh, in a geospatial way where you could be out in the field and be able to see where the utilities were around you. Uh, so as I look, I would be able to see, hey, there's a pipe here, there's an electric line here, uh, so really unique ways that you can take advantage of being able to use these in the field. And one of yeah, in fact, we just it as a way of um, really effective training as well, as a way for you to get people trained and know that they got the same thing and then when they need to go get certified on things to be able to use that over uh, maybe things that are already pre-recorded for the event that they are. And yep. then the um, anchors that come with it as well to be able to even pop up things and it interacts when you get to certain places, which looks really, really cool. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, and I'm going to post in um, ArcGIS did just announce and release um, the ArcGIS for Teams. So it has full Teams integration for ArcGIS, which I know that a lot of you all use ArcGIS in some way. Um, it's a really robust interaction. Um, and at first it was just available for download from the Esri website, but um, it is now available in the Teams app store is my understanding as of a couple of days ago. Um, so there is just, there is so much happening in the world of teams. There's so much happening in our human world, uh, with regard to hybrid work. Um, I really want to thank, uh, Mike for joining us. Um, so Mike, uh, he just works with SLG and, so, or maybe EDU also, but you know, he, he is our, okay. Yep. He's our guy for any of these scenarios, any of these solutions, any of this hardware. So if you, uh, if you need help, um, Mike's your guy. And um, also, um, as always, want to thank Billy Stevenson, um, Mr. Man, Mr. Entertainment, and uh, thank him for his session. Um, thanks all of you all for attending. Uh, I see that I think we've lost three people over the last few minutes. So 
thanks for hanging with us. We ran a little long. My apologies for that. But um, you all have a fantastic weekend. Look forward to next month. All of these things are going to be rolling out. We will keep that um, PowerPoint up to date. And so, in fact, I'm going to drop the link to the PowerPoint in the um, the chat here. So you all can go ahead and pull that PowerPoint down right now. Um, sorry for not thinking of that earlier. Um, this is the link to the slide deck that I only got halfway through. OK, there's the ArcGIS announcement and then there is the and it, it'll always be at that same URL, the aka.ms teams feature guide underscore GCC. And when we update it, you just you can just check it once a week and we will always keep that up to date at that URL. So, again, um, you guys are an amazing community. I appreciate you all so much. Um, thank you for joining this month. Um, thanks for being our customer and you all have a wonderful weekend. Take Mike, care, everybody. I have a quick question, man. Yeah, I'm sorry, I know we're please. running out of time. On those no, tabs, okay. Go ahead. Uh, uh, I just need to ask you. I remember uh, before the pandemic, we went to a lot of training sessions for teams, and you guys had a lot of those showing up. Uh, I remember that you had to log in, though, right? As a person, how, how does the license get handled on those tabs? Who gets to log in? The person, the organizer, uh, or you know, uh, or did you join the meeting from there? And what happens if that person needs to leave or something? Because I remember. We run into that issue in one of your, the training, uh, Microsoft training. The yep. guy that was doing the training, he had to leave and they had to do a bunch of so. How, yeah, how, does, that, do that. how does that part work? Yeah, I'll be brief, but yeah, so the Surface Hub, you would set the Surface Hub with a device account, essentially a resource account within Microsoft 365, and you would assign a license to it. Uh, the most economical being the meeting room license. It provides all the features that are needed to take advantage of on the, on the Surface Hub. And at that point, uh, I could literally forward a meeting to the Surface Hub and one click join uh, into that session uh, within Teams. And so I would be joining as that device account. I would also have the option to uh, sign in on the Hub and see my meetings and files, but I'm still going to join a Teams meeting always as that device account. Okay, yeah, great but, question. Uh, but it can, it, can be, it can be just a resource. License not, and that necessarily need to be needs to be a G three or G five. It is not. They're going to be using G three or G G five. Yeah. So we designed okay. the meeting room license, which is available on the DIR contract, uh, okay. specifically for the types of use cases like Surface Hub. Okay. Thank you, Mike. You got yeah. it. Jose, are you at TWDB now? No, sir. I'll move to TDLR. Remember? TDLR. That's right. Oh, sorry. Me. No, 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 not we at all. I uh, best pause, man, and now it's like you forget about oh, me. It's like you only care about parcel one life. No, I'm just kidding. As you should. <laughs> I'm, a, I'm Yeah, you. you're the one who ran off. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and they so, run me out of a parcel one life, Mike. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> yeah, we. we uh, don't of, be fibbing. I uh, know you guys. You guys are all, both are awesome customers. And thanks, Simon, for jumping in earlier. I saw that he was talking about that. You know, they were waiting on. Um, on the uh, the whiteboard functionality, but they went ahead and went with another solution. Um, where was that yeah, from? Mural. Mural is a is a great Surface Hub partner. Yep. Yeah, I have yeah. customers using Mural. And so um, it is not included with your Microsoft license, but if you have a need, and it has a lot of capabilities that are probably beyond even some that are in the Microsoft um, the whiteboard app because they just focus on whiteboarding. Um, so uh, that's a great solution um, for whiteboarding and um and collaborating okay everybody i'm going to go ahead and stop the recording thank you again for participating thank you